All right, welcome uh, to the Urban Forestry Commission meeting, July 20th, 2022. Um, and to start off, uh, we have two members of the public, Jackie Balance and Darcy Sweeney. Do either one of you care to comment or have any comments for the commission before we move into our regular business? Hot enough for you? <laughs> Thank plenty. you. It's a joke. Thank you for yes. just laughing. It's plenty hot. Um, welcome, Darcy. Nice to see you. Um, welcome. Okay. Um, did all the commit, barring any other public comments, did all the commissioners get um, their minutes in the package with the agenda? Did you have a chance to review them? I didn't read them. Okay. But so take so take take some time. We have I got plenty of time. So <clears throat> does anybody remember how to change your name on here? I had to reset it up. So like I had to reinstall Zoom. How do yep. I put my last name on there? Let's see. Uh, you on the three on the three dots where your name where your picture is where it yeah. says you hit the three dots. Yeah. And you should see edit profile. Uh, it says rename. It doesn't have that. That's weird. At the very bottom. Did you right click on the little three dots? Oh, right click. Oh. Try that. Do you have a mute my audio down to rename? Hmm. Nope, but <laughs> never mind. I don't know. It's minor compared to the problems I've been having before, so. <laughs> oh, Molly, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I mean, computer problems. Not, yeah. Not life problems. They, oh, good. They eat up a lot of time though, those technical problems. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. Welcome, Rob. Uh, we're Hi. just, uh, we're in the section where we're reading minutes. Okay. Whoever has to still read the minutes, just let just let us know when you're finished, and we can go from there. When it comes to Jackie's name, for some reason, I like to only put one L. Sorry about that, Jackie. Spell check takes it out. Okay, I'm done. I'm done, awesome. Anyone else need more time? I had a question though about it. Um, that section about the budget, yeah. um, where you said there's gonna be a new contract for tree trimming. Um, do you mean, when you say contract, that means that DFW doesn't do it themselves, but we, they hire somebody else to do it? We, we, still, we still do it, we just, we need uh, we need to do more trimming, more maintenance trimming than we're capable of handling in house at this point. Uh huh. So, by the, so unfortunately, sometimes by the time we get to a, a to do a trim, the tree is to the point where it might have to be removed. So, do you have to? So, there will be additional money besides what it says there. Um, you expecting additional money for the tree trimming? Yes, the money has been allocated for it already. Ah. Uh. Yep. But it's not going to be DPW that does it. No, it'll be yeah. managed by the by the by, by me with uh, whoever the con whoever the selected contractor is. I'm in the process of writing an RF uh, RFQ for it. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. similar to the tree removal contract that we have <clears throat> that we utilize an outside vendor.
I'll move um, that the minutes of the last meeting be accepted. I'll second. There's a motion uh, to accept the minutes as read and seconded. Is there a discussion? Any changes? Okay, and seeing none, Deb, could you take a roll call vote, please? Gladly. Susan? Yes. David? Yes. Sorry, I almost said Jackie. Sorry about that. Jen? Yes. Ma Molly? Yes. Rich? Yes. And Rob? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, so a couple of things under the chair report, tree warden. So I, I may have mentioned this at our last meeting, but I, may, I don't know if I did or not, but I met with National Grid on River Road. We are going to have to have a uh, public shade tree hearing to remove uh, one, two, three, four, five, six trees on River Road on the left-hand side as you're leaving, uh, going towards Williamsburg. Um, they have to install new utility poles that are along the side of the road because the, uh, there is presently a, a what they call a cross-country line that runs through the woods that feeds Williamsburg from the uh, Florence substation. These trees are all trees that are actually growing out of that rock wall. So they're not, um, they are not trees that were um, planted by anyone there. There's really no place to plant trees there. These are just trees that happen to be in the right of way that are considered public shade trees on our MGL 87. Um, they range at the largest is an eight inch ash and the smallest is a three inch, a three inch ash. So National Grid has agreed to uh, foot the cost for the removals, the mitigation using our scale that we have uh, and um, is gonna pay for the, um, all the, uh, public the uh, notice in the newspaper and everything. So National Grid is footing the whole bill. So that'll be monies that when we receive those monies, the mitigation monies used for um, various tree related planting items or uh, could be part used for a tree trimming contract, et cetera. But that will be happening probably in the next two weeks. Yes, Molly. Are they the trees, so that the trees between the road and the river? No, the other side. Oh. The other side. So if you're dry, if you're driving down the road going to Williamsburg after you go to Highview, there's a large rock face. Yeah. So there they are oh. moving. There's a there's a utility pole system that exists from the 1960s that's in the woods that has to come down on the street so they can actually continue to feed Williamsburg um safely um because their their transmission line is cross country up in the woods it's what it's cross country lines or utility lines that are in the woods that are if, they, if they fail their access is difficult so yeah. um i thought when you said stone wall i was picturing the one on the other side i uh, know no rock rock face rock face rock wall sorry um if these are all ash trees that's just to our benefit because they're going to be dying very soon anyway from the disease you know, you, you make a really valid point. Um, there's actually two American beaches. So American beach oh. are gonna die from, uh, unfortunately, beach leaf disease, which is now pretty much about everywhere in Massachusetts. Uh, and there's two ashes. There's one eight inch elm, which will um, probably end up with uh, Dutch elm disease. Ashes will have emerald ash borer. And then there's one black birch, a four inch black birch. So, um, so I, I'll, you'll see, it'll, it'll be posted in the paper <clears throat> like we normally do it. And then I'll, I'll have a hearing on site. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, just to give you a little update about what's going on in our tree world. So we are, we've been, we've got about a thousand water bags out um, on trees we planted for the last three years. So a little under a thousand water bags, mm. two people, two people watering every day. Monday through Friday, uh, and it's been really, uh, Rob and I both have been seeing um, not mortality uh, on trees from 2019, but definitely trees from 2019 that are starting to struggle, mm -hmm. um, and our watering capacity is at max right now to be successful in like a six or seven day turnaround, so we'll go back to these, we start the original tree, you know, the city's divided in half. Florence and downtown. So, um, but we're out there watering, but it's just been awfully dry. Yes, Sue. New trees on King Street don't have water bags. 
Is that the responsibility of the contractor? That is correct. That's going to be horrible if they die. They're, they're big trees. Yep. I saw them watering once. I watched and they just had a spray, pretty high power spray mechanism. Yep. They were just like spraying around them. Yeah. The, all those, I'm worried about them. All those underplanted shrubs aren't going to make it either. Like no. there's no way. No. No, and those trees, when I was on vacation the last week of June, first week of July, they were planting those trees and I happened to be driving down King Street and I was just sitting in the car, I was a passenger and I was watching them plant them and they were drilling a hole and they were just rolling the tree in the hole and covering it with soil. And so I got on my phone and I called the, the engineer, the resident engineer for the project and said, you know, if you you want to leave them like that that's fine i don't it's fine but when i come over to the inspection we're going to flunk everything so you have to take them out so you might as well fix them now so uh they fixed them wow they had them volcano mulched and they fixed that yes yep. yeah so i you know it's just even though the planting spec that i actually worked with um the landscape architect from mass dot we made sure the the planting spec was the one that we use um it, you know, I don't know if the engineer wasn't happened to be on site that day. I'm not really sure what happened, but it's... did they take them out of the cages? Yeah, they had to dig them back up. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. They had to take them back out. So. Oh. And 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 Rich, if oh. I understand correctly, if they don't water them and they die, they just have to plant them over again, right? Yes, they have a one. So there is probably a a certain time frame that they're responsible for watering, and then we would have to water them in the spring. I have to look at their contract, but the the warranty period is a year. So it's a year from the date of planting. So they were planted in June. We have a year, June of next, of 2020, um, 2023. Just like the ones that died that are in front of Starbucks uh, yeah. from uh, Barrett, uh, Barrett Street, those trees also will have to be replaced by um, the contractor that planted them, the red buds that died and some of the black gums that were in that planting. It's just such a waste of time because, you know, we need that extra year for, for the shade. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. And again, this really just harkens back to my constant thinking about how education is really so important. Um, and not only educating volunteers, uh, but also educating landscape professionals that really do the bulk of the planting um, in the urban environment uh, in these types of projects. So, so I, you know, you know, you can put it in a spec sheet, you can put it on paper, you can show people, but you really have to be present with them to, to really do it. And the other thing too, is that they're, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's profit driven. So it's not necessarily, and it's not necessarily in regards to the tree's health. You know, so it, you can mess anything else up on a tree. You could, you could put the wrong mulch on it. You could, you could plant it even crooked. But as long as you have the tree at the right depth, you'll never have to fix it again. And that's what yeah. I try to do. You only really have one chance to do it right, and you might as well do it right the first time. But so, so that's kind of a quick, just a quick update. There, they are. I haven't been down Pleasant Street, Pleasant Street, because of the construction. Um, and I'm not sure if they planted the trees on Pleasant Street. But um, for that Pleasant Street uh, Road project, that's similar to the one that's on King Street. So I can't give you an update on that one, but that's the one that Rob, Jen, and myself sort of uh, worked on to uh, put a plant material list together and talk about the um, plant material, uh, the perennial plant material. I that haven't seen that, but I saw them with a sidewalk dug up that was like just inches from a tree, from the little trees we planted along there, yeah. which I guess is just, what happens when you get new sidewalks? Yes, they have they have tree protection. It's not the best, but it, they are protected. So yeah, it has a fence, and then the the digging was. Yeah, I think the fence is holding up. I think the tree is holding up the fence. To be honest with you, in some yeah. of the projects, but I mean, they're get they're get, they're they're getting it. It's just taking time. It just takes time. Well, so. thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yes. I have just a couple, I don't know if this is the right place to say that, but you can send me down to later. No, um, there's, I've noticed a couple um, dying ash trees. There's one on uh, Elm. Yep. 
There's one on like the half, there's a part of the crown is dead. I'm sure it has emerald ash borer. And then over on, um, what is it, Carlin Drive? That yep. where, there's some ash trees in there too that the crowns are starting to die. Mm. And then there's a, a big uh, elm on uh, South Street that dropped a big branch and it looks like that's cleaned up, but that's dying too. Yep. For sure. Did you did you happen to see the elm tree that's on Elm Street that was uh, right across from St. John's Church? Yeah, yeah. That thing, that yep. thing just gave up. Yeah, it's croak. Yeah. yeah. Wow, well, bummer. Yeah. It wasn't that one you wanted to remove before anyway, and they wouldn't let you? No, it was the other way around. National Grid wanted it removed. Oh. And I told them, no, no thanks. We'll pass. Oh. We, can, we can run your hardware around it. Okay. Um, and then I, I, I think actually that tree... So, so suffered water starvation it's been kind of having it's been struggling the last few years so uh, but kind it's of like those lindens in that same line too there yes. yeah. Yep. yeah so the ash trees you know as they're showing their decline and their canopies are failing we're, we're taking them down we just yeah. took down four ash trees on carl three or four ash trees already on carlin drive oh, okay. there's also um unfortunately ash trees on cardinal way Mm -hmm. um, so any any of the oh, no. city streets that were accepted as city streets prior to us putting the tree list and planting guidelines together mm -hmm. are mainly going to have ash and oak and maple mm -hmm. as part of their uh, street tree planting, their play out, planting layout. Um, mm -hmm. Same with Village <laughs> Hill. Village Hill is loaded with ash streets, especially Ford Crossing. Um, and Mo, I think it's Moser, as they're going to have to be removed as well, plus Ice Pond Drive. Wow. So there's, there's a lot of places that we're going to have to go back in and, and, and do succession planting pretty quickly. Um, you know, so I mean, we're, we're always, we're, we're just like, well, I don't know if we have any more large places to plant, but unfortunately, Mother Nature is uh, going to be giving us some large places to plant eventually. So it surprises but, me about Village Hill because. They should have been on that. I mean, that seems like I think that was going on in the beginning of when they started planting. So village, the village hill. So the guidance from the planning board from village hill was the tree list that they had oh, okay. previous to ours. Yep, gotcha. So prior to 2016, they were using that list that we no longer use. That's yep. struck from the record. So, yeah, yeah. Yep. So unfortunately, they. They got some of the plantings right in there. Some of the plantings, you know, they didn't know at the time. And yes, emerald ash borer, I think, was out in out in the mid in the Midwest at that time. Yeah. So it wasn't on our doorstep, so people were not as aware of it, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? I I have a question just about the thousand water bags. Sure. Has had, has there ever been like an adopt a tree volunteer watering program? Uh, so I would think that there'd be, my instinct is that you might be able to find, I mean, uh, 50 volunteers uh, during the course of the summer, typically neighbors who would step forward and water the trees. So what, what we've done in the past is that uh, folks from Tree Northampton have watered, um, but, you know, sort of minimally um, mm -hmm. last year and the year before we have a hundred gallon water tank. That they use that they use in the back of a truck that's gravity fed. Mm -hmm. um, we also have reached out to uh, a butters, um, asking them to water trees. If we put you know if, if we put a setback tree here, will you please water it so we don't we can take it off of our list? Which um, is probably more important now than before. Uh, but we don't really have an and we also have a label that's on most of the water bags to say you know this is an emergency please water this tree if you see this tag you know just you know it gives them the directions but no we we don't we don't really have like a formal outreach um and maybe that's something that we're going to have to consider um because I, I i can see that about you know we're getting to about 2000 trees planted at the end of this year mm. so the question is is there you know is our is the operational capacity of the dpw given um, all the constraints by the lack of, um, you know, the difficulty in hiring people. Like, I, for example, that we don't have any seasonal staff this year. Or those are eight vacancies. Mm. So um, that's a struggle. Um, the question is, is that it's a much bigger question. How do we deal with planting going forward? 
um, thinking about climate change, how hot it is, how warm it is, and our ability to maintain the trees going forward. So I think we, I think it's a great conversation piece that should probably be like an agenda item to have a discussion about us, sort of like fitting into our our yearly priorities of planting and where and exactly are, is it how sustainable given everything that we know now you know can we sustain planting 400 trees again every single year or 300 trees what's the metrices we know we can get them planted but the question is can we get the care for them afterwards right and that and david that plays into that whole you know trying to reach out to folks and create a volunteer water force i mean uh, cambridge does it uh, Worcester does it. Um, I know DCR Greening of the Gateway Cities. They they do when they do a Greening of the Gateway City. They have staff that waters, but they also they will plant trees on private property, and they have an agreement form that requires the private property owner to, to water the tree. So they don't once they give the tree to the resident and it's planted, the resident's responsible for watering it. So, you know, I, we, we've had limited success uh, for folks plant uh, watering setback trees. Some do, some don't. Uh, I'll jump in with a couple things. I know there were sure. some academic looks at the volunteer tree watering plant, plant watering programs, at Holyoke and maybe some of the other gateway cities, and they have really high mortality rates. I know personally, I've tried to get people to water trees and they don't wanna use as much water as the tree needs. Um, they feel like it's costing them a lot of money. Rob did some math and figured out, I forget what it costs. Very- It's not really that much money, actually. It's really yeah. not much money, but if they, they get impatient when they stand there watering them and they stop after a couple of gallons. Um, they don't wanna fill the bag all the way up. Um, it's a real, it's really challenging and people, in the hottest months, they, they're less likely to do it. They either want to go somewhere cooler or they don't want to go outside and they forget. It's very hard to have consistency with it. It's continually challenging. Oh, Tree Northampton has, has sent out at least one, we should probably do more emails about it. Telling people well, to water. Yeah. I don't know what, how to measure that, if that has any impact or not. So Tree Northampton sent out an email asking people to water trees that are adjacent or near their property. And I'm, I've been out there doing tree sightings and meeting people for future setbacks. And I'm not seeing people out there watering, nor am I seeing trees that are watered by people. I mean, I, I, I could be missing a lot, but I'm out there like hours a day sometimes. and. And I've been out doing some pruning and working generally on the trees, and I'm not seeing a res much response. And I think it's kind of typical of you know how it works. And I think in Cambridge they are actually using the fire hydrants somehow. Yep, they have they have tree stewards that go around on bikes and they fill up at certain fire hydrants. Um, yeah. and they have uh, containers that they pull around in a wagon. Right. So. But even that, I think I talked to Dave Lefcourt recently, that's even stretched to its limit. You know, I think it's really about, unfortunately, it's about capacity. Um, in, our, in our area, it's about capacity and actually just not having enough staff to complete all the tasks that need to be done. So you have to, I'm constantly like shifting priorities every day. You know, so we'll, we'll skip mowing uh, a cemetery for a week and then they'll two people will water and then the next week we'll take that person from the watering truck and have to go mow for a week to catch up fortunately now the grass is well, in most places it's burned so things are slow but um it, it's it's you've uh, been able to hire any more people rich no no oh dear no there's there's no seasonal staff uh there's no seasonal staff that apply for any of the positions so we're down eight um so it's and those are the folks who would be like on the mowing crew. I would have one seasonal staff person do all watering, you know, half the watering route. Uh, I would feel comfortable if we had some more staff, we could put out some water bags for some of the trees in 2019. But Rob's been kind enough to point trees out to me that he sees that are prior 2020 that need a drink. And we just put a water bag on and we try to get to them, you know, so. But I mean, I, I just think that it's, it's food for thought for um, a future meeting about 
just looking at just zooming out and looking at the whole sustainable piece of what we've created so far and maybe measure how we've done and just have a discussion about how we go forward. And, you know, do we temper, do we, now that we've planted almost 2000 trees, you know, do we temper how many trees we plant every year, not only based on location or lack of locations or maybe lack of available species, but also about our ability to um, sustain their, their life, you know? So it's a bigger conversation I think we should all have as a commission, just because I'm looking for all of your feedback, you know. Any other questions before we move on to the next agenda item? No. Okay. All right. So quick STO update. So two things. Um, I spoke to Carolyn today and Carolyn and I are going to, uh, now that things are a little calmer in the planning and sustainability office, we are going to try to set up a meeting for the next week or so. So she and I can meet to discuss the STO in its draft form. Um, the other piece I have to report is that I did have a meeting with George Kohut, who's the chair of the planning board. Uh, he and I went over the draft. Uh, he is, was very supportive of the draft. He was very appreciative of all the work that we put into the draft. Um, and he, um, we spent probably about an hour just talking about the different points as to why we drafted it the way that we did. And um, he was very, very receptive. He said, you know, obviously this is going to have to come in front of the planning board as a whole. Uh, he said, but I, you know, he asked me if I had met with Wayne or Carolyn and I said, no, because Carolyn, you know, with Wayne announcing his retirement, Carolyn said she couldn't commit to actually reviewing it until after the first of the fiscal year, which has already come and gone. Um, so um, that's where we stand with that. So once I have a meeting in place, I will let you know, and then we will have a discussion and go from there. But I do, George, you know, George's meeting with George was productive because George is really um, hearing, uh, you know, people's desire to protect, uh, you know, trees that are greater than 20 inches in DBH uh, on, on some of the, on, on these projects that have, uh, you know, they're coming from the planning board for special permanent site plan review. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't talk about um, the zoning infill tree protections because there none exist at the moment. But I, I think that is also a place where we need to have an, an, a discussion. Um, but I think we're moving in the right direction with the STO. It's just a matter of getting it, um, a draft hammered out that I guess everybody can sort of agree to so we can move it forward and get it in front in, in the planning, planning board's hands so they can actually, um, you know, review it. And, and if for some reason planning and sustainability office doesn't review it, it doesn't mean that we just can't say, well, here's the draft, here's the draft. And this is what we would like. And, you know, let's try to move this forward, but it would be helpful to have uh, planning support and it would make the process a lot easier. So I, I want to meet with Carolyn and then I will report back from that meeting. Anybody have any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, okay, next agenda item, Urban Forestry Commission replacement. Jackie, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, Urban Forestry Commission replacement. Who, who would like to, I've talked this whole meeting already so far. Does anyone else wanna talk about this particular agenda item? Does anyone have any prospective candidates that they're aware of? Yes, Molly. Well, not really a candidate, but, um... I had a very good um, meeting. I met this young woman. She's probably in her 20s. And she's really interested in the work that we do. Um, I met her in a store downtown that where she works. And um, um, I thought she was going to attend this meeting. But um, I wish she had. She was interested in the, I told her about the Atlantis survey and what the Tree Commission does and everything. And she was going to like sit in on a meeting to see what it was like. But, you know, who knows? She's a potential person who might be interested. I don't know what her skill level is, but we were talking about um, um, qualifications or skills that we're looking for last time. And we talked about maybe somebody who's like social media savvy. savvy. And um, I don't know if she is, but she's young. So she probably is. <laughs> um, 
So I don't know, just a you know a possibility out there. It would be nice to get a younger person involved. Um, Rich, do we still have the same constraints that we had in the past with using social media as a commission, having everything have to go through um, approval of the mayor's office or? Yeah, yes, the answer to the question is yes. Okay. So typically what we would do is we would, we would draft like a press release that we would like. And, uh, and then I basically give it to Donna and she just reviews it and then it goes to the mayor's office. So there really are the last few press releases we've done have been virtually word for word what we have written. Um, so yes, we have, so I, I did ask the mayor that when I, I did. So I forgot to mention to you that I did meet the mayor since our last meeting, which I'm, I apologize. I can talk about that later on if you'd like, but I did ask her that one particular question about the social media thing. And I also, I followed up with the mayor's office last week regarding um, any new, uh, any updates on how the, how the mayor's office is handling the vacancies that they have on the different boards and commissions. Um, and our uh, vacancy is not presently on the cities. There's a little button on the city's website that says boards and commissions. If you click on that, um, you would end up, um, you would see the vacancies on the different commissions throughout the city. And uh, I talked to Court in the mayor's office, and he said that uh, in August, the August 18th city council meeting, the mayor has a bunch of appointments that she'll be asking the council to make for replacements on other boards and commissions. Once those are posted and once those people have been approved, then um, the court was thinking that the mayor actually might do some kind of social media outreach to try to get, um, to get, to get people interested to join these different commissions that have uh, vacancies. So, um, but there is no like formal process. The, the, uh, it's basically been like word of mouth. Um, it's pretty much how I think everyone on the commission presently was, um, was selected and people, you know, I, I do think Mayor Narkowitz put out some kind of a press release uh, or some kind of statement talking, asking for members of the commission. But since then, since we've all of us have been involved in the commission, we've always uh, found someone that was interested, or there was someone sort of waiting in the wings to join the commission. So, yeah, there's about I think thirty six different bodies. Yes, yes, and government, and they I think a lot of them struggle to get people. Yeah, I think they do, and I, one would think that meeting by Zoom now, um, which is by the way extended to March of 2023, would make things easier for folks. So uh, ja anyone, Jackie has a question. Yes, Jackie. Yeah, I, I know a couple of young people who are students at the uh, Conway School of Landscape Architecture. Yeah. Would they be appropriate candidates, either one of them? It, absolutely, they just, the only, they have to be city residents, that's all. Oh, they just moved to Ashfield, oh. Yeah. That won't work, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. That's that's actually a good place to uh, that's a good place to to, to keep keep it in your mind though. That's great. Please. And speaking for myself, I'm open to having you know diversity, age diversity, and um, you know, different points of view, just involving different people in the community. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's great. I I think we need mm -hmm. to definitely start to entertain um getting some young folks that are really want to be involved in the environment um but i just i just think it's it's a time constraint a lot of people are just committed to doing so many things um and i understand that but um so that's the update that i got from the mayor's office so once that the city's website will be updated if we haven't filled the position by then this shows a vacancy and then they will do some sort of social media outreach for the remainder of the boards and commissions that don't have, they're not fully staffed. Hmm. So just, I guess if anyone just keep your thinking caps on, if you know someone. Do we know any more about Christina's thinking? Haven't, haven't heard from her. I know that Rob has been, Rob has been working with her on uh, setback trees and things. I don't know if Rob can speak to that or not, but I haven't heard it. Since my initial meeting with Christina, I have not spoken with her. Right, so she's 
very much interested in working on the whole tree program, tree effort. And uh, right now it's focusing on being out there in the field and working um, on the ground rather than through a computer. I think uh, it's great. She's retired recently. I don't know if you all know that. So, yeah. so she's available and I think she's decided that driving the truck and uh, her, she has a little truck. And so she comes and we do some pruning and meet with people and look, stake out tree sites. And so I think that's probably where she's going to settle. Mm. Now, I'll, I'll just add, I think there's some ambiguity here, but it seems like Marilyn would be willing to serve on an interim basis until we locate somebody if the meetings are once a month and in person. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think that that was originally, so when I had a conversation with Marilyn, after Marilyn sent out the email that said that she was going to have to step off the commission, I had a, I don't know, an hour phone conversation with her about this very thing that David's talking about, and she seemed to be amenable to that, um, but then ended up sort of doing um, sort of a, a, an about face in an email that basically sort of sealed the deal that said that she just couldn't commit to couldn't commit to doing it. But if there's something, so if new information, David, that I'm not aware of, that would be great to know. Um, you know, and I, I'm not adverse to meeting in person. The the only problem I think that we're going to have is that we we have to create a I believe it has to be recorded, but I'm not sure if it's required that it's hybrid. I haven't got that far. So basically we would have to have a meeting location where we could all get to um, that um, you would have to at least have a minimum of a quorum in person. So let's say that Sue and I were able to meet in person, but the rest of you needed to do Zoom, that's not considered a quorum. So we would need to have a minimum of four of us there. And then the other folks could Zoom into the meeting, which is allowed in open meeting law. Um, I'm unsure as to whether or not we and that would require a hybrid type of mode so people from the general public could also join the meeting as well. Hybrid is complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's almost, in essence, it's unfortunate. It is complicated and it's like, uh, it's easier to do one or the other completely. Yeah. You know, um, and I mean, I like this mode of co communication to a certain degree, um, but there's nothing like meeting in person. You know, but this also gives folks the chance to actually come to meetings that normally wouldn't be able to go to meetings or right. might have, it's convenient. Right. Or might have might have a disability and they can't actually physically get to the meeting. Never mind mm. if it's not, you know, they're at work right. or something. So I think it provides more uh community input. Um I think I've said before, since I worked in Springfield, that it, it can be difficult to get up to the meeting mm. in Northampton. And people with young kids have it's much easier to do Zoom too. Yeah. Yes, and there also there is a like a subgroup that was um, that was um, put together by the city council to try to determine why. And I haven't heard much about it, but there's a subgroup working to figure out how um, they can actually find more individuals to volunteer or why they're why built individuals are not volunteering for com community commissions and boards uh, to try to figure out if there's a way that we could um, change the framework locally about how we meet when we meet if it's the wrong time is the uh, child care an issue transportation an issue um, the locations where the meetings are um, you know are they not ADA compliant etc things of that nature but I haven't heard anything other about where that um, little subgroup uh, stands at the moment. So, anyone else have any thoughts? I'm all ears. Anybody have any thoughts? Just randomly, just send them to me in an email. Okay. Does Christina Bizanson live in Northampton still? No. 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 Um, yeah, I, I've kind of thought about different arborists too that might, oh. you know. But I, I haven't really, most of the people that I interact with are, most of them live, they're like working in Northampton or Arborist or live out of town. Mm. Well, you know, Jay Gerard has moved back to town full time. Oh. Uh, as far as I know. 
I mean, let's tap on his shoulder. Yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, I think he he brought a lot to it when he was there, and uh, he's kind of retired at this point, I believe. Yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of like my oh. observation of his schedule. We walk our dogs together, and he seems to uh, live here and have time. Do you want to ask him if he might be interested again? I would. Yeah, I would ask Jay. I mean, I, I he had, earlier I hadn't brought it up because he had talked about getting a job out of town, but I, I see him kind of settling here. So, Jay. Yeah, I mean, I wrote it down. The question. Emailed recently. Um, he likes text. And he's hoping to do more volunteer work. That was to be Northampton. Yeah, so it's kind of a switch. He actually emailed saying, I'm ready to help. Whereas for the last five or six years, I've constantly, can you help? Can you help? Can you help? So now he's on his own. So, it's, so that's what brings it to mind that he might be having more time. That's a great thought, Rob. He's contributed a lot. I mean, both by being on the board, but also in the field, he's take you know he's done a lot of education around pruning and um, he, he's been a real contributor. Yeah, and I mean, I also think that our we have a pretty we have a pretty fast paced meeting schedule. You know, we meet we meet twice a month typically. Um, we're the only other we're the only commission that I know of that meets twice monthly. City Council meets twice monthly, and they're the legislative body of the government. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't know if planning the planning board meets twice a month. I don't think so. This is our next agenda item, right? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm kind of skipping. I skipped over the DCR grants, but I was just kind of thinking out loud that hmm. that that might be also a detractor for some for, for a newcomer, just because of the amount of commitment um, that is, you know, the requirement. You know, but obviously I understand yeah. if people can't make meetings, they can't make them. So, but that's definitely another agenda item to discuss, but it might factor into why people are reluctant, maybe not necessarily on, on our commission in particular, but just in general, why people are reluctant because of the time, the time commitment. Um, so I think just we've got to keep our thinking caps on, keep our ears open, eyes open. Anybody has any thoughts, please email me or Sue. Okay. Um, the next agenda item, I, I put this on here just because I wanted to talk briefly with you about uh, DCR Community Challenge grant opportunities. So I'm, I'm personally interested as the tree warden, not as the chair of the commission, but I'm all in one, but as the tree warden, and actually thinking about trying to apply for a DCR grant to actually update our inventory. So it's been 2016. So it's been, it'll be six years. It'll be like seven years since we did our last professional inventory. So would they, would, would the, the grants in the past or the way they're structured, do they pay for the whole thing or would we also need to dip into um, city funds? Uh, we yeah. would, have, we would have to, depending upon how much the, um, how much the RFQ, because we'd have to write an RFP, how much the RFP is, what the what the what the price is, we would have to possibly dip into city funds. So we did the last time is that Mary Narkowitz uh, came up with 47, he came up with $47,000 plus whatever the, so the, the whole the whole tree inventory was 75000 but don't forget that's starting from scratch. So we already have all those data points in that data layer that exists. We already have a vendor um, that we already used once. That doesn't mean it's gonna be the same vendor, but if we were to do this again that way, you know, I would obviously send them a, uh, an RFP um, for the project. Um, just some, you know, and there's other challenge grants available and I didn't know if someone was interested in actually looking at them. Um, and reporting back out to the commission next month because we, our timeline would be that we would have to have an uh, a intent to apply 
I think their intent to apply has to be done in um, October. Let me just check. I'm looking on my phone. I'm sorry. My computer is acting pretty strange. Have you talked to Donna about it? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't talked. I haven't had a conversation with her because I wanted to talk to you all first yeah. because there's really no point in me asking her for any kind of a lift if you're not interested in doing that this this particular year. Um, if you're interested, then I would um, be more than happy to talk to her. There's no time like the present, I guess, because it would inform where we want to go forward and document what's happened in the past few years with our canopy, our street, you know, street tree canopy. Yeah. You know, it, it, we do have the numbers to, uh, if we could just filter through them to, we can look and see what the uh, num what the trees, what trees we had at the time of the survey and what and we can figure out what trees we have now, except we might not know exactly what trees were subtracted, but we, we know what we've added and we know what, what we had when we started. So I, I've been keeping a little very inaccurate sheet that, that all, so all the species that we plant, I know uh, how many there are altogether and I know what we started with. And that in itself, it were kind of presented more in more detail than I have, would tell us uh, what kind of percentage changes we're, are, we're making to some degree. Um, I don't have a way of tracking which trees have been removed. So we just tell us. Or which ones died. <clears throat> yeah, I, I assume all the dead ones have been removed, pretty much. Are you um, suggesting maybe the project could involve uploading the data that we have. So we do have solid data about what's been planted, yep. where it's been planted. It's parsed out by street number, street name, species, yeah. even more info. And we have and we have just but I mean, we have access to the Davy Tree Survey, which tells us what we did have at the time. So we know what we had in 2015. We know what we have now. And so it's just a matter of like, when you look at uh, ginkgo trees, I mean, I have, I, I wrote down, I have a little sheet where I wrote down how many ginkgo trees we had when we started and I know how many we've added. And, you know, my, my, my work is not as thorough and careful, but I've had that in order to inform what we should plant so that I at least have a general guideline of how much of what we have and how much we, we planted. I think someone working over those numbers would give us a fair amount of the information that we would, that we as a sort of general policy group would want in terms of um, tree species and, and numbers of trees. I think what it lacks and what Rich might entirely, Rich, you can speak to this, be looking for partly is specifically what trees are where and what their condition is. And that wouldn't be part of this. This would just be, uh, finding the diversity. It would be really about diversity and numbers of which species we have. So Rich, is that true that you really could benefit from having an uh, update on, on condition and, and, and uh, that's part of what's interesting you? Yeah, in what, I mean, what's, dri what's driving, so the, the, the urban canopy today is very different for multiple reasons than it was seven years ago. Um, we have um, obviously planted almost 2,000 tree trees, and some, you know, obviously some of them have died, and we've replaced we've replaced them. And Rob is correct; we have a lot of accurate information about their locations, and and our we have an ability to determine species diversity by, um, you know, even by family um, at this point. Yeah. What interests me though is that the the larger overarching tree canopy that we're trying to replace its condition rating. Um, and, and it's a risk for failure just because we have law, we are in the process in the next probably four to five years, you're going to see some big tree mortality. Yeah. And I think you're going to see more of it more frequently because these types of, you know, here we are in a situation where we're just the flip of the total opposite from last summer. 
last summer, it rained. That's all it did was rain. You know, after we had a really hot May and early June, June, it rained from, it rained into basically till Thanksgiving after that. Hmm. Didn't stop raining. So this year we're totally the opposite. So these giant swings, um, you know, trees are, you know, like, you know, trees and humans are a lot alike, right? We're very versatile. We can, we can take change. We don't do well. We don't like change, but we can do it. Unfortunately, trees are, you know, getting hit every year um, with uh, droughty periods, rainy periods, and longer periods. And so what's happening is the impact on the canopy is, uh, is really, um, it's, it's very sad to drive around, to be honest with you, look at all these large trees just, just dying. You know, like that tree in front of, um, at, at, on Elm Street, that Elm by, um, across from St. John's Episcopal Church. You know, that thing just gave up in a week. That was that's a Chinese elm, right? Did you yeah, say I, I think it is? So I mean, I think from my perspective as an urban forester, I think it's important to have updated information on the existing canopy. Well, all all at the same time while adding all the new trees that we've planted because we would just do another survey. Um, I have no idea how much it would cost given we already have a lot of data, but I would be willing to try to figure that out. Go ahead, Jen. So just circling back to what you asked earlier, do you, so did you ask if somebody was willing to look at the DCR challenge grants? Yes, I was wondering if someone on the commission would be willing to look at the available grant material and I'd be willing to work with them, but if, they're, if you're interested in, in applying for a grant um, this year or not, um, if we are interested, I would, my vote would be to do another um, professional inventory or a subsequent inventory to support the data we already have, but there might be other grant packages that you may want to look at. Um, as far as like tree planting and, and monies for tree planting, I think we're, uh, we are um, unique in Northampton because we're in a good position to have funds for tree planting. So, um, you know, that seems to have remained stable in the last uh, five or six years, which is great. Um, but I think, um, you know, data, data, data speaks to a lot of things and data driven. I mean, that's how we ended up where we are, where we determine how many trees we needed to plant and we determine our, our, um, our, species, uh, our species and family breakdown. Um, so I would like to see another inventory done, but, you know, I'm, that's where I'm at. But I guess I'm unclear. So, um, so you were asking for somebody to look at all the DCR grants. Yep. Challenge grant and just report back. Yes. I yeah. could do that. I okay. Could. All right. By Thanks. next, by August. Yeah. Yeah. If you have time, yeah, that would be great because our okay. next meeting is the third, third Wednesday in August. And it's, and what they're called is DCR challenge. Challenge, challenge grants, yep. Urban forestry challenge grants. Okay. Yep. Yep, I can do that. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Thank you. Um, our next agenda item, and we're we're five, we're five minutes, six minutes over. Marilyn, be so proud of me. I'm actually on time almost for a change. <laughs> this is where we need Marilyn to be a guest so she can see that I could do this correctly. No, I'm just not. <laughs> uh, uh, Marilyn, we miss you, uh, is to talk about future UFC meetings, meeting dates, times, and uh, what your thoughts are on guest speakers. So it's kind of a big, it's a big, uh, it's multiple things going on in there. So I, I think maybe we should just, we probably ought to hash out for all of us to, to figure out if we sort of have a loose format at the moment. Our format has been we we typically meet twice twice a month, like in September, October, November, December, January, February, March, and then the remainder of the year we've we've gone to one meeting just because of Arbor Day, because of spring planting. Then we do the summertime schedule. So you know, I get I want to hear from you individually as to whether or not. You think that still meeting twice a month, even in the winter, is productive? Do you feel that it would be better if we met once a month and added a half an hour to the meeting so it's two hours long? 
do you do you want to go back to meeting twice a month every month you know i'm just trying to i'm just trying to sue like a sue shaking her head i'm just i'm just trying to i'm trying to you know hmm. kind of get your input as to what you all think i mean we all have we all typically have the first wednesday and the third wednesday of the month blocked out irregardless and so you know when we don't have to meet it's like oh i got an extra got an extra hour and a half to do something different but um in my mind it's always blocked out but i'm just wondering what you all think about it well it seems like we use the time you know what we've been meeting uh once every other week and it seems like there are things that are discussed but maybe we don't i i don't know could we try it it's hard when it's a city thing because we need to have a set schedule to tell people um, what it's going to be, but maybe we could try it once a month and see how, if it feels like we're falling behind or not able to keep up with everything that needs to be talked about. Maybe we could try that for, say, September through December, see how it goes. I don't know, but I, I don't mind meeting every other week, you know, well, twice a month. Anyone, yeah, Sue or Jenna, or, is David still with us, Dave? Oh yeah, he's gone. Yeah, he's, he's gone. He's gone. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I I like Molly's suggestion that we um we try once a month and see what happens. But that was what you're suggesting, right, Molly? That we try it, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's it's not that hard to. I don't think Rich would have to do it to change the schedule, you know, as long as we're not doing it all the time, just to schedule once a month and let everyone know we're doing that. And then, you know, if during the winter or next spring, that seems to have caused a problem, we can change, make a change. I would support that. I know we, we worked on Arbor Day, you know, really from January on, you know, there were a lot of hours getting the rotary and, those kind of projects, it ends up being a lot. So I would support once a month. It's hard. I mean, the advantage of, of more frequently is that at least for me personally, it's, it's a motivating factor to get things done because I know that there's a meeting coming up, but I want to have certain things done by that next meeting. So, you know, everybody who has such a busy, you know, plate, um, sometimes it's hard to, you know, keep things going if it's only once a month yeah it's it's like a check it, it's yeah a, it's a constant check yeah so I, I i i agree with you and that's why i i personally sort of like the format where during the active season when we're planting you know yeah that like maybe april may june july august september october we would do once a month and then maybe November, December through March, we'll go twice a month. Just because it seems like we have, we seem to have more time to get into the weeds or we have more time to devote um, yeah. in the winter months. And that's maybe because I'm just, I work outdoors, you know, all the time. And I just think that having sometimes, like, I, I agree with, I hear what Sue was saying about the Rotary Club. That was a lot of work. And the other thing too is that last year, um, last late last fall and early last spring, there were some of us that were meeting an extra meeting a month. So there was three meetings a month. So every time we have a subgroup, we ended up having to have a public meeting. So right. Sue, David and I were meeting. Yeah. We met in December, January, March. Right. So it can it can be a lot. Um, we can always add a subgroup if we if we have a project that we need to meet publicly on and keep a ball roll, rolling like we did with the STO. We started having extra meetings, public meetings. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing too, is that we can have a public meeting anytime we want, as long as it's posted 48 hours ahead of time. So, I mean, we, you know, that's how we would do a subgroup, but I, I do agree with all of you that it's nice to have a schedule that um, people can adhere to that want to come to the meetings, you know, we, we have, so if we decide to change our meeting format, we need to post something on the website that says, you know, for these months, we we meet once a month. And these, for these months, we meet twice a month. 
So that would have to be sort of like the city council on their website, you know, during the summer months, the city council only meets once a month. Can the five of us make a decision or do we need, do we, would we feel more comfortable if David was here? Um, I mean, I think, I don't think we need to make it, I don't think we need to make a decision about that right at the moment. I just think we need to, I think it would be good to have carryover discussion next month and hopefully everyone can be there. Molly. What does each one of us prefer? Like, um, I mean, we're talking about all the pros and cons, but yep. like if we were going to, you know, what, what, Sue, what do you prefer? What would you prefer? Once a month, and then we can add subcommittees if we have work that we really want to get moving on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Jen? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I could do, I, I'm pretty, I, I don't have, I guess I don't have a preference, you know? I mean, it's certainly for me, the, um, the regular two meetings a month keeps me a little more honest, you know, but my life is changing, you know, so I'm not going to be hopefully, you know, doesn't look like I'm going to be, you know, at my regular work job this fall. So, um, you know, I'm willing, I, I, I don't have a strong preference, I guess I'm willing to both, uh, you know, I can see the pluses of both. So. Rob? Well, I would go to once a month and then see what damage it does and then fix it from there. Mm. I, I don't I, I don't know. I mean, it could, it, it could be that we find we're pushing off things and not getting anything done, yeah. in which case then we would have to change. But I'd like to see what happens. Holly? My preference is to stick with it two times a month because I, like Jen said, I think it just keeps me, it keeps it in the front of my mind more. And I, I'm worried that if we go to once a month, it'll go off my radar screen and then um, it'll just end up, that time that I would have devoted to UFC will end up just other things will take up the time. Well, we want your time. <laughs> um, but, you know, if it was a, if it was a, um, a factor for people not joining, then that's a different story. Okay. But, you know, we could try something else, but I, I think it, for me personally, it's better to do it stick with what we have now. I mean, I could see, I could see what Rich was saying. Like, I mean, it might seem complicated to the outside person, like, oh, we're meeting right. once a month. Right, that right. That would be the disadvantage. But I could also see, I do think, you know, coming into the fall, a lot of times we talk about, okay, what have we done? It's kind of a self-evaluative time, you know? Um, where many boards would have a retreat or something. We like just deal with it. You know, in the past we've had whole uh, couple meetings where we just dealt with what do we, you know, what are our goals for next year, you know? And I've always found that kind of helpful and I could see that happening in, in those extra meetings. If we chose one meeting a month, those extra meetings in the fall and just talking about you know, when we talk about tree purchasing for the next year and what's the next Arbor Day project and are we continuing the neighborhood plantings and, you know, right. kind we of a time, have time of evaluation. And we often will do that in, you know, October, uh, well, probably November, December, January, you know, because I think we're probably going to be up against my gut feeling is shifting things a little bit because we're kind of maxed out with maintenance of new plantings, we have less spaces to, less easy spaces to plant, you know, large plantings. And, you know, I think, I think we are in a place of um, shifting a little bit is my gut feeling, you know, of how much we can get done, where are our priorities, you know, it's, I don't know, I could be wrong, but. That's what it looks like to me. Rich, what about you? Um, I, I would agree with um, what Jen just said about shifting, slightly shifting priorities. Um, I, I'm okay 
it's easier for me because a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the um, operational stuff around the commission and putting the commission, you know, getting together the agenda. Um, I don't do the minutes. Thank you, Deb. If I had to do the minutes, I really would definitely say once a month yeah. only. Um, but I can see us doing sort of a hybrid where, you know, the month of May, June, July, August, September, maybe we do one meeting a month and the rest of the year we do two meetings. I do agree with Molly um, and Jen that having the two meetings a month does keep me, keeps me in line, keeps me in line as well. I mean, I'm, I'm here every day, right? This is what I do for a living and not, not the commission part, but, uh, you know, I'm working every day, but it does keep you in line and it does create a place where we can have conversations about uh, upcoming projects or priorities. Um, and I think if we do make a change, we need to just make something that's consistent so the general public knows what the consistency is. That's really important to me. Um, because we, you know, we, we've been since 2015, we've been meeting, you know, basically twice, twice a month. And, and um, you know, and back to the, the your thoughts on whether it's detracting people from joining the commission, I, I don't. Uh, just, I'm sorry if I, I made that inference, but I don't know that for a fact. I'm just saying that, no, might, be, that might be a possibility. In, in support of two meetings per month, there's also um, been sometimes when something is moving pretty fast through planning and we've through mm -hmm. these meetings right. to communicate and get people there. Yeah. Speak up yeah. for the trees. And that's important too. So that, that's actually a really good point, Sue, because that's how yeah. we were able to hammer out um, the, uh, the, uh, working with planning on the ordinance for the, uh, two family by right. Mm -hmm. And also yeah, exactly uh, what I'm thinking of. Yep, hammer they, up the sometimes ESA. they get things rolling yep. and sneak up and then yep. boom. And yeah, so good point. Good point. So we'll stick with two for the time being, maybe discuss it a little bit more. Is that where we want to leave off with this? I mean, I, I think in all fairness to David, I like to I like to have uh, yeah. David's input at our next meeting. So if you're okay with it, I'll put this on as an agenda item. Very good. And yeah, I think we should stick with two for now and okay. get David's opinion and, and then just see if it seems like things are slowing down, then we could, you know, consider going to once. Okay. But you know, but also those like in the summer, I agree. We can just do once a month in the summer or just a couple times in the summer. Do we need to um, vote on this? I mean, do we need to set this up? I'm just asking in a procedural way. Do we need to, you know, have an email that goes out or here are the options, come to the next meeting, ranking the options, or are we? do we need to vote on it or anything like that? Um. I don't think we need to vote on it because we we have we've already decided that we're only going to have one meeting in August. Okay. And then um, we're going to stick to the two meeting format starting in September. So we can this is what we've done for the last several years now. So we we should just have. Um, I mean, I can send an email to David and ask him what his preference is, or I can leave this on the agenda for next month so we can hear from him. I, I, you know, I can do it either way. Yep. Um, I think we just have to change the website. Yeah, so we would have to change the website that will reflect what city council does. Basically, we would just say that the month of uh, the month of May, June, and July, May, Ju June, July, and August, we we just do one meeting, one meeting a month. City council does uh, just one meeting in July, one in August. But that's, you know, they have to have the budget the last, usually the last city council meeting of June, they vote on the final city budget draft for the following fiscal year. All right, so I, I will reach out, I'll reach out to David if you're okay with that and I'll just get here. Yeah, that's great. Okay, all right. Um, another part of this, uh, of this one agenda item was guest speakers. So um, Sue, I know that I, I talked to Sue earlier last uh, late last week about possibly doing um, a some either guest speakers uh, once a month when we're back to two meetings a month, and possibly having a joint 
urban urban forestry commission and Amherst street committee meeting hmm. um shoshona on the amherst commission or committee they call it um and i have been playing phone tag but unfortunately i haven't connected with her and got some dates when i'd hope to kind of come up with some tentative dates to throw out but um i could email those to people i guess molly i think um thinking about a meeting with the Amherst Commission, we should, maybe you and Shoshona or whoever should like figure out what, what is the purpose of that and what are we trying to do in that meeting? Are we just sharing like what we're doing or are we trying to like get specific information or you know what exactly? I think on one level to informally build relationships between the two towns, the people who are working on trees um, and then more specifically, if people have questions about watering um, capacities, um, species, vendors, you know, anything that people are interested in. So I think those are, Brands. we should like figure out what those specific things are. Like what, what specific information are we trying to get? Would we like to get from them that we need help with or resources? And what do they, you know, what do they, Think they might like to know about what we're doing or how we're doing something you know like yeah another thought i have is that you know, rich primarily has been doing a certain amount of outreach with other communities that have smaller budgets and um i know um you know are they doing anything like that i don't think so because i think where they are is they don't even have funding for tree plantings that much as far as i know they don't even have a budget item and they need help, you know, how to go about with their form of government, how to do that. I am aware that that is a, an issue for them. So, you know, they would have something to gain in that respect, but certainly I could come up with a list of some things if other people are interested, or is it not a good use of time to have these relationships with our neighbors? I think it's useful to know I guess what I would like is to know um, what are they actually doing? Like, are they in an active planting program? What are some of the issues they've come up against? You know, are there any um, problems or controversies or and how they've handled those? And um, um, maybe like, what are the ordinances that they have? And yeah. mm -hmm. is there anything that could be applied to what we're doing? Um, I think they were really helpful when we started getting, when by, before me, when this group started getting going, I think, and Henry's been good about coming to our meetings. Henry Lapham, one of the volunteers. And I think I Alan just, Snow has also helped out. I'd also like to know like what, um, for example, with the spotted lantern flight, are they doing any kind of, you know, proactive kind of thing? You know, uh, can we get any ideas about that or about the Emerald Ash Borer? Okay, Pess. Yeah. So that's one topic. There's a lot of room for sharing. And when we started our program uh, in informally, uh, there was a lot learned by Amherst because they went before us. Um, and so sharing, you just pick up little things often practical. How are people coping? I mean, we don't really know uh, in Amherst, I don't think maybe Rich does, how they've dealt with uh, people watering trees, you know, have ha watering. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, there's there's something we can learn from communities, and something communities can learn from us. I mean, we could uh, also look at their minutes from their meetings to get an idea of, you know, get a general idea what what they're up to. Yeah, yeah. And but so I, I think sharing with communities is is really good. We would not be, we would not have gotten as quickly to where we are without. Uh, learning some things from Amherst. Yeah, early on, we used them a lot. I know yes. Lily and Rich, like, they yeah. they just communicated a lot. And especially, they were the ones, I think, that helped us get hooked up with Marley, uh, Molly Freilicker. Um, they came to our, our meetings, some of right. our meetings. We went to some mm -hmm. of their meetings. Right. They really helped us out. There was a lot of sharing. Um, I, so I think we kind of have, you know, in some ways, a karmic responsibility to share with other communities that aren't as far along as we are but also 
I think there are other communities definitely um, that have aspects of their programs that we might learn from quite a bit. Um, I mean, we could just kind of go around what's the, what's working really well with you. Where, what are your challenges? What do you wish for? You know, just have kind of some kind of general conceptual. And I bet you when you went around the room, people would have different opinions and, you know, just. Yeah, it's particularly valuable, yeah, to see what their pro how their programs run and also their volunteer, those that have volunteer elements, how they're doing with that. Um, I'd be really curious to know whether the current weather patterns are hurting them as much as it's hurting us. And in other words, we're having an unusual number of trees die. And uh, I'd be interested to know if other people are too and how they're coping with it. And it might make sense eventually for the tree groups to speak up together and get more attention. Molly. Um, I'd like to know what um, educational things they're doing. Okay. And like how, how they're doing them. Are they doing door hangers or... Um, like programs where they speak and people come, you know, talks or like what kind of educational things and how are they doing them? And how have they worked? Has it, has it worked out? Okay, should we move on? Yeah. Yeah, was anyone um, else have any questions? I can okay. do a brief thing on the spotted lanternfly. I also noticed that David Rabinowitz is here and yeah. I don't know if he wants to say something, you know. Uh, Can we squeeze him in? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> squeeze me in. I just appreciate being here and listen how you folks operate. The, uh, the tree inventory grant that Rich was talking about is very interesting to me. Um, I am not a resident of Northampton, however, mm -hmm. so I can't be on the committee, but uh, I appreciate just seeing how a committee operates. What what Wait. town are you in? Pelham. Mm -hmm. ah. so we don't have nearly the resources or the even the population to do the extent that Amherst and in Northampton does. Mm -hmm. But um, but you're not you're not acidified. You have more trees just by the nature of your town. Yeah, yeah. It's very rural. Uh, it's. I wouldn't even call it an urban forest really, except that there are roads and the trees along the road, but um, it doesn't, it's 1200 people, a pretty big square miles. I don't remember how many, but uh, yeah, it's pretty rural up here. So- but, Are there any particular issues that your town, um, you know, that you'd like, that you think you'd like to learn from what we're doing that would apply to your town? It's the same, the same, uh, pests and the same uh, uh, fungi and bacteria, you know, the, the, the same diseases are affecting us that are affecting you guys. Mm. And, are you hoping uh, to plant replacement trees as older, mature trees? I don't, we don't have a system that well developed as far as I know. Um, I've been in a little uh, contact with the tree warden but just by email uh, we haven't even met yet i was away for a while and uh he seems like like he's completely busy but i don't know why we don't have a tree group here uh mm. i mean we're a small town and it takes a lot to get anything done but uh, I, I don't see much in this way of citizen action groups in this small town I mean, people are concerned with other things like leash laws and <laughs> library. The library, yeah. The library is established now, though, so it, it yeah. really works on so its own. Um, please know that, um, you know, we'll make time if there's anything, you know, well, I personally I will I'll inquire. I, I will inquire with the people that will know and see if there's anything actually being done in terms of citizen action groups. Uh, not that I'm heard of or aware of, but uh, like I said, I haven't been around enough in the past few years to, to really have a, a handle on it. But 
it's it doesn't seem like a priority here. You know, there's thou you know hundreds of maybe even thousands of wooded acres around here, and mm -hmm. people don't pay as much attention to the trees because there's. I don't think they pay attention to the diseases as much mm -hmm. as you all do in Northampton and Amherst. Well, right. that might be a, a segue into the next um, agenda item, which is um, the spotted lanternfly. Um, Love it. Rich, could you give me a share screen? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, um, so, David, what we've been trying to do, we don't have spotted lanternfly in Northampton yet, but we're it exists. Yeah. It's in one. Um, it's in one uh, town already in Massachusetts, and so we're just like thinking about trying to be proactive. I'm going to share a screen, um, a map of Northampton. Um, can you see that? Not yet. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so, oops, I don't want that. Darn it all. Um, darn, I was just trying to move this over. Okay, there. that's what I want. Okay, so um, the purple areas are ones that have already been surveyed. We're surveying for the Elanthus tree. The Elanthus is the main, a primary host of the spotted lanternfly. It's a non-native um, invasive species itself. Um, so the areas that are in lavender have already been done. Um, the blue are outlines of um, survey blocks that are available for people to do if anybody wants to do a survey. Um, I can assign you an area um, and uh, help you get started with that. The red are dots where there have been Elanthus um, recorded. Um, Move in a little bit here. Um, it's very impressive, Molly. There's a cluster down here, which is like around um, Maple Street, Nonatuck area in Florence. Um, there's a cluster here at the cement factory. Um, there's a couple, this one, I just discovered this one today along the bike, the bike path goes like this. I discovered a female large, like 15 inch right here today. Oh. And right here is also another large um, female um, and a male and several um, saplings that have grown from that. Um, there's a fee one of these here on um, South Maple is a large female. And there's a couple in the woods behind the houses over here and the others are kind of smaller ones. Um, let's see, this is a tiny sapling. This is a tiny sapling. The ones up here at the co-op, I don't think they're there anymore. I think they're gone. Um, let's see, down here is, oh yeah, these two are Pulaski Park, right at the edge of Pulaski Park. Um, they're also saplings. They're where the bike ramp, like where, where the bike ramp is. Um, let's see, what's this one? Um, let's see now, where is that? Let me just uncover that for a moment. Um, oh yeah, this is behind the Gazette building. This one right here is on Smith College property in their, their, their uh, work yard, like where they have gravel and stuff. And this is right behind the Gazette building, a little sapling. Um, and these are ones, hmm, I don't remember what they are. Um, and then there's a couple random ones over here, not very big. Um, oh, and this is Agnes Fox Field. Um, there's a, the one there is a male. Anyway, so there's, um, we're starting to get a sense of where some of them are. Um, they, you know, they tend to be in the urban, like hedgerows, unmaintained areas between houses or along fences. Um, you know, they're not, there are a few along the bike path. Um, 
yeah, mostly kind of urban areas that are neglected. That's where you're going to find them. So, um, are there any people who would like to take on a, a zone and I could send you a map? Or we could do it together too. I think Jen said- I'd like to do it together with you. Was interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna, I have to go away to my dad's house next mm -hmm. week, but when I get back from that, I, I'll contact you the begin, uh, beginning of August. Okay. I, I'll, get, I'll get in touch with you. And I'll be away the first like week and a half of August, but I'll be back okay. after that. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. The one that you um, confuse it with the most is black walnut. Right. You need binoculars. Yep. Molly, yeah. were, were any of the ones that you found in the public right of way? Um, well, yes. Um, the one on South Maple Street is, it's on the hill. There's a new four-way intersection there as you're going down the hill towards Nonatuck. Yep. It's there. Um, and the ones on the bike path, I don't know if that's considered a right of way or not. Right. Um, Let's see. So, yeah. So, so, Rich, if if there were if there is one in the in a public right of way, mm -hmm. do you have to have a tree hearing to take it down? It's healthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. You do. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Molly, this is really impressive. Again, second time I've said it, but um, did you have a chance to contact any of the the academics? ecologists or other folk etymologists um, to see if well, anybody's doing I'm not anything. directly not in person oh rich you were going to contact that person from yep um, I, I have not made contact with her yet but i will yeah. i have a note to, a note in big letters right here yeah we're trying to find out if you know what is actually being done for management in whatever that town is where it exists in massachusetts are they actually doing any you know, um, of the insecticide or herbicide to take trees out. Like a question I have is if we remove Alanthus, does that just put more pressure on things like black walnut, you know, or does it keep, you know, does it keep the spotted lantern fly down because, you know, maybe they'll skip over Northampton if there's not very much Alanthus. Um, uh, maybe we take down females where we can and treat the males as you know, with the um, systemic um, insecticide, or I don't know, it's different options. Um, but a lot of these are on private property, so we'd have to, you know, get permission. But like the cement factory, for example, there's a whole little cluster of them in the woods there. So that would be a place that if we could get permission to treat those, that would be great because it's starting to spread. The bike path ones would be important to do because they're producing babies. Um, yeah, so eventually getting permission from people whose property they're on to take them down or whatever we decide to do. So when you say treat, what is that? What does that mean? Um, treat? Well, you can um, once the spotted lantern flag comes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't have to do anything beforehand. But if they come, um, you know, to treat the tree that they're in, right? you know, you could use it as a trap tree if you remove other trees. Like you would want to use a male as a trap tree probably and take down the females if possible because they're the ones that are spreading seeds like crazy. So the idea would be to have as few Atlantis trees as possible, know where they are. When the bug comes into town, it'll go to that tree before other trees. This is the theory. That's what and I'm thinking. Kill yeah. all those bugs as soon as they get to town. Mm -hmm. What what town is the uh, spotted lanternfly in in currently? I forget. It's one of those. Um, it's in like northeast Mass. Fitchburg yeah. in Worcester County. Oh, Fitchburg, right? Fitchburg. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Worcester too. No, Fitchburg Worcester County. Worcester Fitchburg. County. Yeah. Oh, Worcester County. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Molly, thank you. Could you mind stop doing a, a screen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, and I would be interested when you come back, maybe Jen and I could go around 
together and do a section if you want to do that, Jen. Yeah, I'll have, yeah. I'll have, I'll have a little more time. Yeah, okay. I think um, doing it on a bicycle works pretty well because you can go <laughs> slow enough to like look left and look right. And I'm like looking behind people's houses as I go. And I have a pair of binoculars so that if I see something that looks like it might be uh, like check it with the binoculars and try to see if it has teeth on the leaves or if it has black walnut nuts or yeah. ailanthus flowers. Yeah. Okay. Um, any, any other questions for Molly, anyone? Uh, any other, if no other questions, any other business not anticipated by the chair? Anybody have anything they want to bring up? No. Uh, okay, our next meeting, uh, 817, which is the third Thursday of the month. Perfect. Um, all right, and uh, I will reach out to David. That's my to-do list. And I also have to reach out to Tony Siminski. I have two notes right here. Um, <clears throat> David, thanks for coming today. I will see you in the morning. Thanks, uh, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes. So we're by Jackie. Thanks for coming. So we'll see you next time. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Move. And yes, I have a second. Anybody second? I'll, I'll second, second it. So all, right. all in favor. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you, Deb. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody.